Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started with the webinar in just a minute. Do you see my screen? Yep, we can see it, Felipe. Yep, that's right. Looks good. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. My name is Sarah Carr and I am Chief Knowledge Broker for OCTO, which is Open Communications for the Ocean. Uh, today's webinar is also co-sponsored by um, IUCN's World Commission on Protected Areas Marine and uh, NOAA, the NOAA Marine National MPA Center. Uh, we're very glad you could be with us today. And um, we wanted to welcome our speakers today. Uh, we have three speakers for this webinar. One is having technical issues and has not been able to get on just yet, uh, but we're hoping she can join us. But I'll go ahead and introduce everyone. Um, first, we have Felipe Paredes. He's the Marine Vice Chair of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas and National Coordinator for MPAs uh, with the Ministry of Environment Chile. We have Helen Klimek, who's a Program Officer for UN, the UN Environment Program, World C Conservation Monitoring Center and Sue Wells, who's the chair of the IUCN World Commission on Protected Areas MPA Management Effectiveness Task Force, as well as an independent consultant. Um, the format for this webinar is that we're gonna have um, initial presentations. Um, after the short introduction, we'll have initial presentations by the speakers and hopefully our third, hopefully Sue will be able to join us uh, before it's her turn. And, um, and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, during the Q&A, you can ask questions in two ways. You can either ask questions by typing them into the uh, question uh, panel, uh, where it'll only be seen by the panelists and myself, and uh, or you can type it into the chat. And everyone, um, you can make it visible only to, to me or to the speakers or all attendees. Um, we welcome your input on all matters related to marine protected area management effectiveness um, in the chat panel. And you're welcome to share it with everyone. We just ask that you keep it professional um, and on the topic uh, with the chat. So feel free to make your questions visible and any responding to other questions that you see. Um, I'll turn it over to our speakers now. Um, oh, before, before I do, I have one more thing. We're also going to be hosting another webinar related to this one on marine uh, OECMs, other effective area-based conservation measures, uh, this Thursday. I'm going to be posting the information about that in the chat, um, but we welcome everyone to attend that webinar. Uh, it'll be this coming Thursday for an hour and a half. and. Uh, it's entitled everything you wanted to know about marine OECMs, but didn't dare to ask. All right, thanks. And I'll turn it over to Felipe now. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here uh, giving some um, opening words on the, important of, the importance of management effectiveness for MPAs. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for organizing this um, webinar and to our speakers, uh, Helen Klimek from UNEP and Sue Wells from the, the WCPA, the World Commission on Protected Areas. So uh, I would like to introduce you uh, what, uh, what we're doing at the, the commission. Let me see. 
Okay. So first of all, uh, what we do at IUCN, first of all, IUCN is, a, is an inter, uh, intergovernmental institution organization uh, with more than uh, uh, 1,400 member organizations from uh, state governments and, and agencies uh, to non-governmental organizations, big and, and small NGOs, and indigenous peoples and local people organizations. So we have a, a big number and diversity of members in, at IUCN, uh, which they gather every four years at the World Conservation Congress, and, and they draft the resolution, which are finally the mandate uh, for IUCN. And then uh, what we do uh, at the commission, the commission uh, of, on uh, the World Commission on Protected Areas is one of the six commissions that we have at uh, IUCN. And we work closely with the IUCN secretariat that is you know, based in England, in Switzerland, and with more than 50 offices around the world. So that's uh, what we do with the mandate of the members. Uh, we. Um, uh, trying to implement all the resolution that come up after the World Conservation Congresses. And then what, how we do this is trying to influence and, and take action uh, in different ways. Uh, and I think the most important one is the policy impact. We, we, we work with the organizations and governments around the world to uh, try to implement uh, all these um, uh, recommendations from the members and the different commissions uh, to have an impact finally uh, in terms of uh, conservation and in this case, uh, MPA uh, management. So what is our vision as, at the WCPA? Uh, basically, uh, we work everything on uh, protected and conserved areas. And we would like to have a system of uh, PAs and conserved areas that are effectively conserving uh, nature and, uh, and as such are recognized and value both our corners as cornerstones for conserving biodiversity as the um, as nature solutions to global challenges providing benefit to humans health livelihoods and well-being so we we push the the pa and in this case the mpa agenda uh, as one of the main tools for conserving biodiversity and we don't see pas and or mpas as a separate part of the world um, of the environment, we see uh, these uh, PAs as solutions uh, with people within, uh, uh, providing benefits uh, and well-being to uh, the human um, around the world. What we do at the, um, our mission at the um, uh, my, my thematic vice chair, the marine vice chair is basically protecting the blue planet. You know, as you know, 75% of, of the surface of the earth of the planet is uh, ocean. And we have a big, big goal of protecting at least 30% of that 75%, uh, which means pr protecting, you know, what is, the oceans under national jurisdiction, but also uh, the high seas. And that's an important uh, part of our goal within the, the vice chair of uh, the marine team. So um, our mission is to protect at least 30% of the, the ocean uh, by a global representative system of effectively managed and lasting network of marine protected areas for the well being of the society. So uh, as you see here, our mission includes uh, how um, our MPAs are managed. It's very important for us not only to concentrate in the number, you know, the quantity, you know, the, the surface, the, the number of hectares of square kilometer, but also the quality, you know, in terms of management. We have to uh, both uh, make progress in the quantitative part, you know, the numbers, but also in the qualitative part of the, the goals, and that means um, having uh, effective management. We have different objectives, of course, uh, protecting at least 30% of the oceans in not only creating MPA, but also creating uh, MPA networks uh, to ensure better application of the best technical um, um, policy advice. Uh, generating and synthesizing and disseminating guidance and knowledge on MPAs. And I think this webinar is part of that objective. 
uh, develop enhanced capacity. Uh, we know that the challenges of implementing and financing MPAs is huge. So uh, we had to develop these capacities, fostering uh, innovation to come up with uh, new solutions, I, um, innovative solution and ideas to tackle the current and future challenges. I think the challenge of implementing MPAs is huge. So we, knew, we had to think out, outside the box and see what new technology can help us in this task. And finally, inspiring the new generation of MPA leaders and practitioners. So why we're talking about effective management? And, and, and I would like to just point out one big um, scientific finding that was actually published last year. And I know that Helen and Sue are gonna be uh, talking about this in, you know, in, the, in detail, but I really like this article that for the first time, or one of the most uh, robust scientific evidence that provides um, you know, uh, data on what are the best, what are the aspects that provide best ecological and social results. The, and that's what we wanna see on MPA. We want to see results underwater you know, in our MPAs. And one of the main aspects first is the level of protection. It does matter if you have minimally minimally or highly protected or fully protected MPAs. Of course, the category, the objectives of MPAs uh, do matter. So the, the more protected, the more restriction you put on an MPA, the best in terms of results. And then the high level of management. Of course, we know now that both considering the categories and the level of management being here, um, you know, um, actively managed, we will see here the, on the top right corner that with a high, res, highly restricted MPA and which are actively managed, uh, we will see the best results. And that's why effective management uh, really matters. Thank you. Thanks, Felipe. I think I will jump straight into my presentation now and then we can get to the questions that participants might have after that. And hopefully Sue Wells will be able to join us afterwards. So I'm just gonna share my screen. I hope you can see that. Yes, we can, Helen. Great. Yep. So hi everyone. Um, it's great to see so many people joining from all over the world. Um, so my name is Helen Klimek, and I am a program officer at UNEP WCMC. And for this short presentation, I'll just be talking about indicators for monitoring the effectiveness of protected areas at the global level. Um, so I'll quickly give you a recap of what we're currently doing in this space to monitor the effectiveness of protected areas. Um, also talk a bit about what the limitations are of this approach and then give a bit of an indication of what the way forward is. You know, what are we doing to kind of address the limitations that we are currently facing? So how do we currently monitor the effectiveness of protected areas at the global level? So as many of you, or maybe all of you on this call will know, um, there's been a significant growth in the global protected area network over the past few decades. Um, but also, we know that biodiversity continues to decline, and that's also the case within protected areas. And evidence has, or research has clearly shown that protected areas best conserve biodiversity when they're well managed. So the main way that protected area effectiveness has been tracked up until now has been through protected area management effectiveness assessments. Uh, we, we also call these PAME assessments. And there's a lot of methodologies available. We have over 60, 69 or even 70 methods at the, at, at the moment, um, which allow protected area management uh, managers to assess what's going on in their protected areas and what is currently um, working well and what isn't working well in terms of them achieving their management objectives. So um, yeah, there are very, a, a huge amount of methodologies available and these vary in scope and in content. And if Sue is able to join us later, then she will talk a bit more about the details of some of these methods. But essentially, most of them rely on self-assessment and they're best suited to understanding 
the effectiveness of management in specific sites at a given point in time. So they're, they're less well suited to um, you know, comparisons of management effectiveness between sites, and that limits the extent to which they can be aggregate, aggregated into global indicators. Um, and just some examples of what these methodologies are. So there's the management effectiveness tracking tool, which is quite well known. It's also known as the MET. And then there's some that are a bit more specific to marine protected areas, such as how is your MPA doing and the management effectiveness assessment tool. So as I said, hopefully Sue will be able to talk a bit more about these when she joins. Um, so the Protected Planet Initiative um, provides the basis for monitoring and reporting on progress towards international targets related to protected areas and conserved areas, and that also includes the emerging post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And there's a whole suite of um, databases that are part of the Protected Planet Initiative. The one that's most relevant for today is the Global Database on Protected Area Management Effectiveness. Um, and so this is essentially a database which um, tracks where protected areas have conducted a management effectiveness assessment. And here is a, a quick screen grab, screen grab of what this database looks like. So it's effectively a searchable database that is based on site level management effectiveness assessments, which are submitted to us by a wide range of governmental and non-governmental organizations. So you can see that there's a name of the protected area on the far left, and then a unique ID that's associated with that protected area, and then the name of the methodology and um, the year in which the, the assessment was conducted. At the moment, um, the Global Database on Protected Area Management Effectiveness stores assessments from around 170 countries, um, conducted using 69 different methodologies, but at the moment, only about 11% of protected areas in the WDPA have been assessed for management effectiveness. So that's quite a low proportion. So what are the limitations of the current monitoring approach? So on the one hand, it does provide information on whether site, a site has conducted a protected area management effectiveness assessment, but it's also very limited because the database that we currently have does not provide details or information on whether conservation and social outcomes are actually being achieved and maintained through time. So it's really a very superficial understanding of management effectiveness, which we really need to go beyond. So what's currently being discussed at the global policy level to try to address this limitation? So negotiations for the post-2020 biodiversity monitoring framework have been ongoing for a couple of years now, um, just like very, all aspects of life really, um, they've been disrupted by the COVID pandemic, but there are now draft targets and indicators um, to monitor progress to 2030, which are still under discussion. Um, so the draft target three is the one that relates to protected areas and OECMs. And the overall, the overriding target is to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. And as I said, the draft target is still under negotiation, but there are key elements here which we can pick out, um, and they relate to areas of importance uh, for biodiversity and its contributions to people. Uh, the target, the draft target, also emphasizes effective and equitable management. Um, ecologically representative and well-connected systems, um, which are integrated into the wider landscape and seascape. So here we have the draft target written again. And in addition to draft targets, we also have headline indicators, which have been proposed to monitor progress towards these targets. And the current headline indicator or proposed headline indicator is coverage of predicted areas in OECMs by effectiveness. As I said, this is still under negotiation, but it, we can kind of assume that whatever the eventual formulation of target three is, the concept of measuring effectiveness is likely to be a, a constant component. And um, there will be some kind of indicator that will try to assess the effectiveness of protected areas and OECMs going forward. 
the question really is, is if we're going to measure protected area coverage by effectiveness, you know, do we have the tools available and necessary to do that? Do we uh, have sufficient data so that will allow us to monitor progress towards this ambitious goal that we have of protecting 30 by 30 and also ensuring that the protected area state is effectively achieving conservation objectives. And the way um, we, where we currently stand, um, essentially, we really need an evolution of the current indicator or the current system that we have to monitor effectiveness. Because the global database on protected area management effectiveness um, needs to adapt or evolve to really achieve the remit of assessing effectiveness of protected areas at the global scale. And so one of the objectives of a workshop series that I am, you know, WCMC and IUCN hosted towards the end of last year and early this year was to try to um, really address this issue. So really explore alternative or improved ways of monitoring effectiveness at the global level and develop a roadmap towards developing fit for purpose indicators. And so one of some of the key messages were uh, there's general agreement that the current indicator based on the global database of protected area management effectiveness does not provide a sufficient measure of um, protected area and OECM effectiveness. So we really need to move beyond this system. We really need a flexible system, which acknowledges that different CBD parties have different reporting options and capacity and availability of data. And there is also recognition that significant resources are still required to develop capacity for site level assessments and reporting. In terms of what's now happening at the global policy level um, with regard to the post-2020 monitoring framework development process, so currently, um, started today actually, the fourth meeting of the open-ended working group on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework is advancing negotiations and producing a final draft of the post-2020 framework. There will then be a technical meeting on indicators um, next week, uh, which we held in Bonn. Um, and that will really be a technical review of the proposed indicators and assessment of the feasibility for parties to use them to report towards the global targets that are agreed. And then the CBD COP15 will be taking place in December where the post-2020 global biodiversity framework will be adopted. And yeah, in the, in the meantime, there's a lot of ongoing work and opportunities for collaboration. So at UNWCMC, we're working with partners to refine options for fit for purpose indicators for protected area and OECM effectiveness. And we're currently developing an information document together with IUCN and JNCC, uh, which will be submitted to the CBD COP for consideration by parties. Uh, we're also working with IUCN to clarify the links between different PAME methods and the IUCN Greenlist standard. There is a general recognition that the Greenlist standard could serve as a really useful framework for assimilating um, or kind of translating many existing assessment methods of protected area management effectiveness. So that's another ongoing area of work. And then we're also working with in-country partners to support um, the process towards achieving and monitoring the 30 by 30 target. So yeah, basically the take home messages from my presentation. So there is a current system to monitor effectiveness at the global level, um, and that's through the global database of protected area management effectiveness. And this approach is a good starting point, but it has its obvious clear limitations. And so there's, a lot of work going on to address these limitations and identify fit for purpose indicators. Um, and we're feeding into the global policy discussions uh, related to this. Um, the CBD targets and indicators are still under discussion, um, but effectiveness is likely or will definitely be a key element of the, of the target that is eventually um, adopted. And in the meantime, there's a lot of opportunities to collaborate. So. Um, yeah, if you have any questions or would like to, to chat a bit more about what I've talked about today, then please don't hesitate to get in touch. And I'll end there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Helen. And thank you, Felipe. Um, I am so sorry, but Sue has still not been able to join us. Um, 
so I'm assuming she's experiencing technical difficulties that are and are, are preventing her from getting in. We'll still hope she can join us in a little bit, but we do have some questions right now. Uh, so we'll go ahead and go to the Q&A. And if, you, if anybody has questions, I would encourage you to send them in right now. Um, you can either type them into the question and answer panel or into the chat. Um, so we'll go ahead with the Q&A. Um, this one is for Felipe. Uh, it is, I have a question on the objective of 30% protection. Is it realistic to aim for 30% MPAs, considering we are still at around 7 to 8% after years of important efforts? What about OECMs and other management schemes providing not for actual protection, but sustainable management and use? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yes, it's, it's, um, it's a big question, you know, why, why uh, we should be protecting 30%. And, and, and I think that comes from uh, very strong scientific findings. Um, the current level of um, biodiversity loss and uh, habitat and, and, and uh, ecosystem degradation in the oceans, uh, the, the number of threat, threats that we have in the ocean and, and, and also in the land and um, terrestrial ecosystem, um, the rates of the, this uh, um, threat is, uh, is alarming. It's, it's, it's uh, very urgent to act now and then conserving a, a, at least a third, you know, to conserve all these ecosystem services is the minimum. I mean, the, and the goal is, is, uh, is uh, very clear that it's at least 30%. So it might, it, it, it could be more than 30%. So that's a, a scientific finding. And then if you go to a recent re report from IPCC on, you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there are now actually recommending between between the 30 and 50 percent. So um, they're recognizing the, the, the role of the, you know, nature. Uh, now, you know, in all the climate cycles that we know that from, from, from the science. So, um, of course, conserving 30 percent of, of, um, of the, um, you know, the world, the planet is not an easy task. And uh, when you, you know, in, get into reality and you need to see where, you know, you are going to be protecting is, of course, there's um, many considerations that have to be considered. So it's, it's, it's not an easy task. And that's why we should be preparing for this uh, goal, you know, from now. Um, and I know that, you know, that's, uh, that's the goal to conserve uh, um, uh, 30 percent and, you know, the, the, the current data, as the question mentioned, is only um, reporting that we have been conserving um, between 8 and 10 percent. So we need to speed up the goals and, 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 um, and, and you know, have a strong plan to, to fulfill this, uh, this uh, 30 by 30 uh, goal. And one of the alternatives, of course, is other, other, other uh, uh, areas, other sites that are actually conserving in, in, in reality, uh, they have positive uh, conservation outcomes. And these are, you know, the, the so-called OECM that, that are other ways of uh, having uh, positive conservation outcomes. Uh, and of course, that's an alternative um, to uh, make progress in the, in the, the goal. Uh, but we have to be very careful on providing a very strict uh, control to what we understand as, as uh, OECM. So that's why uh, um, IUCN and, uh, have produced these guidelines uh, and have made a definition on OECM and is now providing very step-by-step -step guidance on uh, doing this uh, checklist, this um, analysis. Uh, that is had to be done by site by site. So it's not that a category or a way of uh, an area based management uh, uh, can be a OECM. So you have to very strict, um, you know, sticking to the IUCN guidelines. And uh, that my understanding is that now the, the CDB is also recognizing this uh, check, these uh, guidelines. So uh, if we are very, uh, if we stick to the um, uh, recommendations, 
um, I think OECMs can be another alternative to um, um, fulfilling the, the goal. Okay, thank you, Felipe. And thank you, Helen, for answering a number of questions uh, through the chat and uh, typing. Um, there was a question that came in, given the complex and violent history of colonization, many protected areas in the global south were created excluding local peoples and indigenous knowledge. How is indigenous knowledge being incorporated into MPA planning and management? And I guess we could, uh, uh, you know, then turn that to sort of management effectiveness. Well, I can I, may, I can answer that. Um, well, I think it's important just in terms of colonization and you know uh, the the consent you know or the participation of the the locals. You know, if, if it was considered or not, um, of course we we also have guidelines on what is the what it means to have a good. Uh, governance for PAs and and you if you go to uh, that guideline you will see that there's fine main uh, aspects that you, you should consider for a good governance of, of a protected area and one of them or um, is you know uh, considering the opinion of the local people so uh, to validate the creation of MPAs uh, to have a free and informed consent in many cases that the, uh, about the creation of the MPA. So um, if, um, you know, MPAs were created before that, uh, in a way, uh, the, the management at least, or maybe the, 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 the whole creation of the designation MPA should be consulted and make um, a, a space in the block for the local people to be part of the management and 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 see the MPAs as a benefit for them too. Yeah, absolutely. So the free prior informed consent is essential and an essential component of really any conversation that we have around protected areas and OECMs. Um, and it's also highlighted within the CBD framework. Um, so yeah, it's a, you know we have to really get away from this fortress con conservation approach and acknowledge that you know indigenous peoples and local local communities are must be engaged and must be kind of the drivers behind uh, conservation efforts okay thank you guys um let's see this one came in i have a question for helen thanks for a very clear presentation on gp pame and its limitations when you say fit for purpose indicators of management effectiveness, does this mean that indicators are very specific to the ambitions of each and every MPA? Many MPAs are established for reasons beyond strict nature protection, such uh, to allow co-management, facilitate restoration, provide a space for trialing, integrated management, protecting cultural values, et cetera. Management effectiveness evaluation of such protected areas should consider whether they're achieving their goals, whatever they are, no? Yeah, I think that kind of um, speaks to the central challenge of developing global indicators is that obviously at the site level, um, marine protected areas and protected areas on, on the whole will have specific objectives that they are trying to, trying to meet. Uh, and so, what we're trying to do at the global level is assess overall effectiveness. We need to come up with indicators that allow us to do so, but at the same time um, that we don't lose the nuance of what individual sites are trying to achieve. So overall, um, MPAs are trying to achieve conservation, uh, biodiversity conservation. That was why they were established. That is the definition of protected area. Um, and so we need to find indicators that are globally applicable, um, but don't yeah, are still, uh, kind of still maintain that nuance of what si specific sites might be trying to achieve. So it's kind of trying to find that balance between local nuance and global applicability. And it's a difficult problem we've been trying to solve for many years now. Um, and we're still, you know, engaging with partners to try to find a uh, best way of doing that. I'm not sure that answers the question, but essentially it's a question that's still open and we're, you know, very happy to hear from people um, and engage with other people who we might not have engaged with so far on that issue. 
Okay, thank you so much, Helen. Sue, welcome. Um, I'm sure the last half hour was probably pretty stressful, or last hour. Um, if you are able to, um, if you could go ahead and try and share your presentation, we can switch to your presentation. But while you're doing that, we'll just go ahead and do some more questions. Um, let's see, uh, another question that came in. Once an MPA is created, how long after can an assessment on its effectiveness be conducted? Is there a specific time frame? I think that's maybe one that Sue will be able to speak a bit more on once she's done her presentation, or maybe one we could get back to after her presentation. Um, because that speaks to kind of marine protected area effectiveness assessment, specific assessment methodologies. So some might be more um, appropriate for um areas that were recently established whereas others might kind of emphasize repeat assessments over time so i think let's get back to that one if we can okay. and sue i'm happy to share my screen and share the presentation if you like sue you're muted right now so we, we can't hear you okay now now we should be able to hear you Oh, but we still can't. Okay. We s okay, try again. No, we still aren't able to hear you. Um, maybe I could pick up another question that I saw yep. come through the chat. There was one about um, different PAMI methods and how they relate to the IUC and Greenlist standard. Yep, that sounds great. Go for um, it, Helen. So I, I kind of briefly alluded to, to, to this, but we're doing a lot of work in this space because I think in the past, people have been overwhelmed by the just the amount of methodolo methodologies that are available and unclear as to you know, which methodology is appropriate for which context. Um, and the IUC and Greenlist standard kind of offers an opportunity for us to bring all these different methodologies under one hood. So it addresses you know, the four key components of what an effective uh, protected areas should be. Um, and so what we're trying to do at the moment is kind of crosswalk or translate different uh, PAMI methods to the IUC and Greenlist standard to clarify how, for example, does conducting a MET assessment um, relates to then eventual green listing. And so that's kind of an ongoing piece of work. Um, so watch the space. And if you have done an assessment like a crosswalk like this before, you've assessed how uh, a, a standard or a, a method that you might be using relates to the green list, then please get in touch with me again and we can discuss how we can integrate the work you've done into our work. Okay, thank you, Helen. Um, Sue's gonna try logging off and logging back in. Um, uh, okay, so there was a question that came in uh, early on, I guess it could be for either of you. Are we expecting 30% to be at a high level of protection or a subset of the 30% to be at a high level or fully, fully protected? Uh, Felipe, do you want to? Sure, I, I can answer that, yes. Uh, well, um, as I is, you know, presented, you know, the last slide in my presentation, you saw this, um, um article you know that was published last year in science that um is you know providing very strong scientific evidence that uh, the more uh, restrictive are the mpas you know in terms of you know um uh, restricting the access and the uses of human activities the the, the better the best so uh, if we want to see you know the the the, the best uh, outcome from this cons from conserving the 30 percent uh, we should consider more strict you know um, mpas but of course uh, the category the objective of the mpas is one of uh, many other aspects you have to consider when creating mpas you know of course the the previous users you know the the, the cultural um, um, visions of the, the, the oceans we have to be considered. And in, in many cases, uh, we choose to, to, to have other categories for the MPS. Um, so, but the re recommendation would be um, that, you know, the more strict the MPS, the better. Okay, thank you, Felipe. Um, a question came in for, for Helen. 
Um, let me go find it again. Um, where was it? Oh, if two separate evaluations are submitted to the database and they have different results, how is that reflected in the database? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if or how often that has happened, um, but I would I don't have a good answer for that. So I would you know either have to get back to whoever asked that question um, at a later date. Okay. No. Um, but just to reiterate, because this is something that's been coming up in the chat, um, that the global database doesn't provide details of the assessment results. So it only provides information on whether an assessment has been conducted or not. So that's the only information that's displayed in the database. And so whether, you know, that's a, whether there's a conflicting um, assessment or not is kind of not relevant, I guess, to the database and the data that it's currently showing, if that makes sense. Okay, well, and, and related to that, there's the question. Um, similar to Nicholas's question in the chat, are there any plans for data providers to have to provide their assessments to GDPAME as it would be very useful to see the assessment? If not, does the GDPAME team get to see the assessments to ensure that they have in fact been completed for the site, even if they are not then made available for public download? Yeah, so this is another thing we're working on. So we need to, it's clear that the GDPAME needs to be evolving or you know it needs to develop because the information that we're currently displaying is is not detailed enough to give us a sufficient overview of effectiveness so what form that takes is kind of still being discussed whether it's you know adding um additional uh yeah adding additional information to the database that we have currently or restructuring the database to collect information on, for example, governance and then also biodiversity outcomes in addition to management effectiveness assessments. That's all still kind of a moving, a moving target. So we're really figuring out exactly that question at the moment. Um, I will put a link to the uh, user manual for the GDPAME that I think will be helpful for answering some of these questions as well in case we don't get to all of them. Um, Cause I've just seen that Sue Wells have just come back online. So. I will add the link to it in the chat to that. That's helpful. OK. Sue, can we, um, let's, you want to test out your sound? You're muted right now. Can we hear? No, we're still not hearing you, uh, unfortunately. Um, is it, there's a, um, you can test your audio by going at the lower left of the, the user interface. And there's a little up arrow. It gives you the ability to sort of make sure the settings match the um, headset and mic any headset and microphone that you're actually using. Okay. Can you try talking now, Sue? I heard something. No, okay. Okay, well, we'll go to another question. Um, let's see. Uh, so there was a question, can Helen share more information about the work of UNEP WCMC with in-country partners to support process towards the 2030 target? Yeah, sure. So this is kind of primarily centered around a a new project that's funded by the uh, Bezos Earth Fund, um, and that's specifically um, working with Congo, DRC, Gabon, Peru, Colombia, Bolivia, and Ecuador. Um, and the work there is around supporting them um, to identify priorities for achieving the 30 by 30 target. Um, protected area targets, so that involves um, identifying potential new protected areas and OECMs, mapping these, and also efforts to uh, increase effectiveness of existing protected areas and OECMs and reporting towards those as well. So um, yeah, if you're interested in learning more, again, get in touch, but that's kind of the, the gist of it at the moment. Okay, Sue, so let's try again. 
I do apologise to everybody. I've just such so many ditches. I am so sorry. Well, it's there's time just to quickly shoot well, through. Well, there's still time, actually. Helen, would you be able to share the presentation? I think that, that would be better. I, I, don't, I won't tell however many people <laughs> it is on this uh, my laptop. It is um, no, we, we all understand. All. <laughs> We've all been through this. So uh -huh. Helen, yeah. Helen shares the presentation. Sue, you can give your presentation. We still have we still have 15 minutes and then we can stay on afterwards okay. for anyone who is okay. able to, to answer some questions. So we're just glad right. you made it and that we can give the presentation. Uh, OK, oh, thank you. Thank, and thank as well. You all the audience for that tolerance I do. Okay, just take a deep breath all as well. I'll, and I must I'll apologize for a little bit. Of, I must apologize for some background noise because um, I'm not in a very good location either. Um, so anyway, you've heard from, can you all hear? Could somebody do a thumbs up sign? Yeah, okay. Yes, we hear I'll, well. I'll sort of talk over it. Um, so you've heard from Helen, I know that. Luckily I've seen Helen's presentation and I have seen Philippe. So, um, so Anyway, I'm Sue Wells. Um, I've worked for a long time on marine protected areas and been interested on um, PAME assessment for many, many years, having had practical experience out in uh, the West Indian Ocean. Uh, so, and I've got increasingly involved in it. And um, I got very interested in the fact that there are all these tools are now being developed um, in, for different purposes, as we'll see. And um, I'm feeling it's time that we really started to look at how we can share our experiences on pain assessment for MPAs and to be a little bit clearer about what these tools are for and how we can use them. So if we do next slide, Helen. Um, so just to remind ourselves of why we assess uh, management effectiveness, um, Helen's talked about the global reporting and how this is becoming very important. But of course, uh, the fundamental reason is to improve management of the MPA itself uh, and to build capacity to identify gaps and priorities. That an assessment can really help one work out where things are and are not working. And I think we need to start thinking a bit more about um, assessments in the same way as we use them in other walks of life. Uh, in many countries, uh, hospitals get assessed, the schools get assessed. We make assessments ourselves. Helen, next slide. Uh, so it's uh, uh, this was a, a cartoon we used um, doing training courses on MPA assessment in uh, well over 10 years ago. Uh, if you're making a bus journey in, in England as much as in Kenya or Tanzania these days, you weigh out uh, if you want to go from Nairobi to uh, Mombasa or from Cambridge to London, you weigh up. Uh, how you're going to go, um, am I going to the means of transport that's get, going to get me to the right destination? Uh, does the driver know how to drive, etc.? And So how, how do you want to be? Do you want a nice effective journey from A to B? Next slide, Helen. So it's nothing particularly unusual. And um, back in 2006, um, IUCN, um, with the help of Mark Hawkins, developed this framework for uh, evaluation or assessment and um, identified the six components of um, doing an assessment that cover all aspects of protected area management from the context through to the planning, uh, the inputs, the process of actual management, outputs, and the outcomes. Next slide, Helen. A lot of you will be familiar with this picture. And uh, that then leads us on to think about, well, what do we mean by an effective protected area or an effective MPA? And I think the jury's still out on that. The, everybody's idea of what success is, is is different. But when you think about all the components of management, it's quite clear that really to do an assessment and to think about good management, we're looking at all aspects um, of, of um, conservation, if you like. And um, there have been a number of papers uh, recently on how sites can be an ecological success, because obviously most of us are conservationists on this, um, but then they can be a socio-economic socio failure. And we haven't always thought about whether a site is well managed, uh, as you might 
perhaps in an assessment of a hospital, obviously the final outcome there is that you're treating people and you want them to get better, but you do also have to think about is the hospital building well managed and are the staff there uh, happy in their jobs? So um, as, a, as a starter, if you like, the IUCN Green List Standard, which has been being developed um, over the last 10 year, years or so, is, is one way to look at it. Uh, a lot of people, I think, think it is a good way to look at it. And there are these four pillars. Uh, it's designed uh, looking at the framework that Mark Hocking has developed previously for um, effective management. So you've got governance, uh, design and planning, uh, the effective management itself, and then the successful conservation outcomes that you want at the end. Next one, Helen. And um, this it, it can be applied to anything. Um, it has a set of criteria and generic indicators. And I've just put up some examples for each of the four components because it sometimes can be difficult to sort of think. So what do you mean by good governance? Well, one indicator might be that the governance structure is very clearly defined and you, everybody uh, to do with the MPA knows how, who is in charge, who's making the decision and how it works. And then equally, another aspect of governance was, would be whether stakeholders have some role in it and what this might be. And similarly, you can see the various uh, just examples of indicators for the different pillars. Next one, Helen. Uh, so then the question is, how are assessments done? And there are a huge range. I think Helen's probably mentioned already that there are many, many tools. A large number of them are being done through questionnaires uh, these days. And this is just an example. I don't know if you can see the screen very clearly. Sorry about the background noise. Um, and uh, th these are, this is from the MET, the Management Effectiveness Tracking Tool. Uh, and it just, if you can see it, I hope, or you can enlarge your screen. Uh, the question here is, are visitor facilities and services adequate? And you have a set of four options for answering uh, as to how good they are. And in the case of MET, you have a numerical scoring. Next slide, Helen. But the um, questionnaires can be done in all sorts of ways. Um, I'm, it's okay to put this is actual results. So anybody from Ambassa Marine Park doesn't need to feel worried. This is an assessment from about 20 years ago. So I'm quite sure it doesn't show what's happening there. There we used um, a system where we had a qualitative rating system and we had a set of questions about the legislation, the planning. Uh, and whether the capacity for dealing with these aspects um, was adequate, whether it fair or good or poor, we had a, a four point rating. Um, this slide also illustrates two other points I wanted to mention about assessments. One is making sure that for all these on these questionnaires or other forms that you're doing in this, being quite clear as to what the justification is for any kind of ranking score. Um, really identifying what the problems are if it's a low score. And then identifying the opportunities or the actions that are needed to improve the situation. Next slide, Helen. And then um, the, I just briefly mentioned terminology here. A lot of people, because it's called management effectiveness, many people have thought it just covers the actual management, you know, enforcement, et cetera. But of course, it's actually much broader than that. And what we're really interested in is the outcomes or the conservation uh, achievements. And this, again, is a very, very old example from Cousin Island in the Seychelles. Uh, and there they developed this table for assessing uh, the conservation outcomes for the various ecological targets and objectives that they had. Next slide, Helen. Uh, and just uh, another point, really, because obviously there's so much one could talk about with these assessments, whatever tool and method you use, um, it is very important to remember that you do need to produce the results. Helen, I think, has talked about the difficulty of publishing globally the detailed results from assessments, and there's a lot of um, there may well be sensitive issues around this, so it is difficult. But um, at the site level, you want to know the results, you want your um, other staff to know the results, you want um, stakeholders to know the results. And there are, of course, many ways of presenting it. Uh, 
one of the advantages of the Met is that it has an automatic um, system at the end. You can take the various numerical scores and it will produce these bar diagrams or spider diagrams. Um, but it is very important to think about the reporting in a way that people can understand. Next slide. So now I'm just, this is a really quick overview just because there are a lot of tools out there now. And I just wanted to get across the way that they've been desi being designed for different purposes, because this is very important to think about this. Um, there are a number of global ones that can be used for MPAs and for terrestrial sites. Um, I think the, I've mentioned the MET already. That's even a requirement for GEF projects now. So that's why it's become particularly popular and important, but it's now being um, used much more widely than, than just for projects. Um, IMET is another very well-known one that's being introduced through the by an IUCN project, Biopharma, in the African, Caribbean and Pacific oceans. Um, the Integrated Management Effectiveness Tool quite complicated, but um, it has a big database and information system attached to it, which is obviously useful. Uh, RAPM was, is a very straightforward one and was one of the very earliest ones to be developed, I think in 2003, so that's still worth looking at. Uh, next one, Helen. Uh, then as time has gone on, we've had assessment tools being developed for thematic purposes. So there's the, um, how is your MPA doing? Many of the older MPA people will remember that one uh, that was um, introduced, has been used in a number of countries. Uh, the MET has been adapted for Ramsar sites, that's for wetland sites. SAGE is a, a one for social um, equity issues and governance, and that's just being rolled out now and specifically looks at the governance and um, social aspects of, of MPA, of protected area management. Many of you will know the uh, methods being used for World Heritage Sites, and we're also getting an increasing number of ones for uh, particular aspects, like in this case, Marine Mammals Management Toolkit. That was a new one that came out this year. Next one, Helen. Uh, there's also regional ones being brought out, so that's uh, taking some of the uh, international tools and adapting them for the particular purposes of a region, given the differences in protected areas. Uh, the EU is just in the middle there, in the middle of doing what looks like a very nice one for marine natura sites. A lot of discussion going on about that. Uh, the Coral Triangle was well in advance. The Coral Triangle countries had assessment tools some time ago. Next one. And now one of the things we're finding is that the global tools, they may be fine at the global, if you like, at the global level, but they often need adapting to suit an individual country. And that's really the way I think people seem to be going now, taking the broad general principles uh, and adapting them to um, to individual countries. And I mean, there are, there are probably 40 or 50 countries. These are countries that have actually got uh, assessment tools either specific for MPAs or that are um, very suitable for MPAs where they've designed them to definitely suit MPAs as well as terrestrial sites um, and a lot of them have been published uh, recently and are available uh, so worth looking at. Next one Helen. And I thought I'd mention here that because we also we talk about assessment very broadly, but actually if you start to look at it now, there are sort of various categories of it. Um, these are two, and I've called them award programs. Uh, the IUCN Green List, I've mentioned it already, but the, the program itself, um, it, it's very intensive uh, assessment. It involves an independent certification um, process, and it's a big incentive. Uh, because once you're listed on the green list site, obviously it shows that you're good. So if you like, it's a kind of award program. We've already got 11, over 11 MPAs. Uh, site in Malaysia got listed just this year. And there are about 20 MPA candidates and many, many more terrestrial and protected areas. And then the blue parks, many of you will be familiar with that. There are over 20 uh, blue parks. 
uh, that doesn't have an indep independent um, certification component to it. It's done by more as an assessment by experts. Um, but that similarly goes through a lot of the same criteria as the, the IUCN Green List standard um, and uh, is, a, is in, in a sense an assessment. Next one, Hannah. And then uh, some of you may be wondering why I haven't mentioned the MPA guide. Um, so I'm, I, this is really for discussing, discussion. I'm thinking this is perhaps more of a, a reporting or a classification tool in that it doesn't go through the same sort of um, assessment as some of these other tools, um, but it does allow you to um, report very clearly on the stage of, a, of establishment and uh, regulations and, and what's been achieved at the protected area. And you may have already had discussion on the MPA guide in relation to other tools. So I'm sorry if I missed that. Um, the protected area management categories uh, are also a very useful classification tool and the governance category is increasingly used now. And there's the regulation-based classification um, system, which you can find on the Blue Parks website. And then the regional seas conventions, they're developing or developing assessment stroke reporting tools, which um, uh, I think are, are very useful. And I, I hope down the line that we can have some kind of discussion about what these tools are for and how you can use them and whether they're more actually to see how well the site's been managed or more to, to report globally, um, which is, is so important now. Next one, Hannah. Next one. Oh, sorry. Um, so just if you were to be thinking about selecting a tool, um, the first thing is think about why you're doing it. What is it you want to tell yourself? What, or what is it you want to do with the MPA? Uh, are you doing it primarily to build capacity and to improve management in the site? Hopefully that would be the first priority anyway. Um, but then, you know, what scale, what level of detail? I think one very important thing to think about is how often uh, are assessments needed? And I think when this whole concept was originally developed and it was thought very much on this kind of business model, the idea was it would be combined with management plan revisions because it's at that point when you revise a management plan that you have to look completely across the board. Um, and I would urge people to look at um, existing tools already and learn lessons from other assessments before launching into developing a new tool. Okay, next one. Uh, so just a few quick uh, principles. Um, it's key to, to bring together the data before you embark on assessment. That so often gets forgotten. This doesn't mean you need to collect, have a mass of monitoring data. One of the things you might want to show is that you haven't got good ecological monitoring programs going. So, but before you start the assessment, you need to know the answer to that. So, so that's an important issue. Um, We've I've mentioned that many times, act on the result, don't do an assessment and then just put it on a shelf, use it for adaptive management. Um, presenting the results uh, and thinking about how widely you're happy for the results to go. Um, then involve stakeholders and other agencies. A number of the tools have been developed as um, self-assessment tools, and I think there's a lot more discussion needed on that. So an MPA manager might do the assessment um, themselves and, and I think we need to think more about that the experience so far is that they work best if you involve stakeholders and other agencies and then I think the other thing we do need to be thinking about is how the assessments are stored and recorded and some of the tools being developed have got that inbuilt and um, once you've done one assessment the next one is going to be so much easier if you've got the old assessment to use as a basis as a baseline. Next slide. So thank you very much. And once again, many, many apologies and apologies for the background noise. No problem, Sue. Thank you for <laughs> fighting so valiantly to get in. We've all been there before. Um, if I don't know if Felipe and Sue and Helen have a few more minutes, but there are a couple questions I wanted to hit that I think might have been targeted to Sue. And so we'll stay on it and, and tackle those if you guys can. 
Um, so one question that came up uh, was once an MPA is created, how long after can an assessment on its effectiveness be conducted? Is there a specific time frame? Uh, I'd say no. I mean, the uh, most, uh, not most, MPAs that, oh, I do apologize for the noise. Um, MPAs that are um, funded by the GEF, they have, I hope you can hear me. Um, sorry. I don't, I don't think you can do about it. Uh, I think it will stop in a moment. You really want to do an assessment at the beginning because then you'll really start to see uh, what your baseline is. A new MPA, it might well have a set of data already for that area so that you might be well off of that, but there might be no stakeholder set up. So then, you know, so a GEF project, uh, to standard ones, you do an MPA the very first year, you do it in the third year and you do it in the fifth year. Uh, that's for, that's the project approach uh, for an actual MPA itself, not necessarily funded through GEF. Uh, you, as I said, you might want to do an assessment when you start your management plan, and then at the uh, regular periods for reviewing a management plan. But you might also want to do it more frequently if you think things are changing fast. That's the other thing. If things are changing fast in MPAs, which they are these days. You might decide, you know, with, I don't know, coal bleaching or aspects of climate change that we really need to be doing a certain aspect of the assessment every two years. Okay, thank you, Sue. Um, and Sharif had a question, which I would really love to get to. Let's see. Um, oh, oh, but I think Helen, okay, Helen is, uh, okay, moved. Uh, Okay, it was about the cost and duration for getting an MPA or OECM assessment done for the green list. Do you have any idea of the costs and, and how long it would take? So yeah, um, I'll do how long first because that's enormously va variable. Uh, that will depend on how sort of organized the site is uh, and the whole process because it, because it has, uh, it is like getting a, certified product for fair trade or something. Uh, you've got to have all the experts identified and committees set up um, within the countries concerned. So once that's all established, then new sites can get relisted much faster because the process uh, has been developed for that country or that network of MPAs. Uh, I think the California MPA network is going through the process and it's actually quite slow because they're the first network of MPAs that's been done under under the green list so that that's actually going quite slowly um, in France which was one of the test countries for the green list standard right at the very very beginning um, so there they looked at MPAs and terrestrial sites together and a lot of the criteria and indicators um, were developed as a result of their experiences. They're now able to get sites through the candidature process really quite quickly. This doesn't mean to say that they, they do it any less thoroughly. It's just that they've got all their systems in place and they know exactly what to do. So um, Malaysia, this um, it's uh, it's actually a small community tourist tourism associated with a resort privately run and community run. Uh, management area in Malaysia. And I think that's taken about three years to go through, three, four years. Um, WWF helped a lot, helped set up the expert system. Uh, if you want more detail about some of these specific issues, please, please get in touch um, because I, I can tell you about that. Uh, and the cost, right, that, that again depends enormously on the country uh, concerned. And again, the cost, I think uh, they're finding the cost obviously goes down once the first one's been done. And uh, Mark Hawkins puts out this ballpark figure of $10,000, but quite what he's based that on, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I think we'll, we'll start to get some figures on this quite soon, hopefully. Okay, thank you, Sue. Um, is there a guidance or a place where all the information you've shared, Sue, is summarized? All the information about the various tools? Okay, now I'm glad you asked that, Sarah, because had I been more organized, I had this 
got better, this thing. I would have started that. So we set up this, well, we've had uh, this management effectiveness task force, uh, which has been around for a long time and so hopefully some of you are, are on it. Um, I want to resuscitate that. Philippe is being incredibly supportive and helpful. And through that, we want to set up an information sharing system of some kind, the details uh, to be discussed and anyone with any bright ideas, I'm discussing it with Helen as to you know, how they can help with Felipe and um, various other people interested in this. But if anybody's really, really keen to join in, uh, I mean, I can imagine we can have, uh, you know, put help with the port support of people like Sarah not to put out regular updates. Um, but we do need to set up the information sharing system. In the meantime, I'm collecting stuff just myself, uh, just because I'm interested. Um, so please get in touch with me, send information. And what I want to do in the first instance is just send out a list with links to all the main tools. Um, and, and then we can take it from there. Okay, thank you. And uh, there were still some more really interesting questions questions that we're not going to be able to get to, um, including one on counterfactuals and cultural heritage and, and others. And I'm so sorry about that, but we're going to call it a day now. Thank you so much, uh, Felipe, Helen, and Sue for doing this. And Sue, I, we've been talking about doing this for so long, and I'm glad we were finally able to do it, to have this webinar. And um, my email is Sarah at octogroup.org. If, if um, there are specific topics on management effectiveness that people are interested in, we can see about doing more on this topic. And um, I hope everyone saw the link for Thursday's webinar on OECMs. Um, so thank you, everyone. And thank you to everyone who attended and put such great comments and great resources in the chat and asked wonderful questions. We really appreciate you attending and participating. And um, you could be on our presenting on our next webinar. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And we hope to see many of you on Thursday for the OACM webinar. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.